How perfect. John is professor of art history at James Madison University and researches artwork by and portrayals of African Americans, particularly during the second quarter of the 20th century, as well as art markets and collecting in the United States. He's author of man a book titled Manufacturing the Modern Patron in Victorian California, Cultural Philanthropy, Industrial Capital and Social Authority and I'll translate that to you. It's an amazing book on the collections of uh, many of the, uh, the, the Transcontinental Railroad uh, founders and the art that they collected. And it's one of my favorite books and how I got to know John initially. So I recommend that. It also won a very major award from the California, uh, College Art Association um, a few years back. And another book uh, titled Moybridge and Mobility uh, published by UC Press and Ott's uh, chapter in that volume examines the representation and social mobility of black athletes in the Gilded Age. And he's working on another book right now called Mixed Media, The Visual Cultures of Racial Integration. So John, we're happy to have you here with us um, virtually. Wish you could be back with us um, in Reno again, but it was nice to have you here in March for the fateful blizzard. Um, nevertheless, I'm uh, looking forward to your talk today. We will take questions following the talk, both online in the chat as well as live in the audience. So watch for that um, at the end of the presentation. So I'm gonna pass it to you, John. Yeah, thank you so much, Anne, uh, for setting this up and also to Colin, Caitlin, really anyone who was involved in, in arranging this. Uh, I was of course crestfallen that the big blizzard of March uh, prevented the talk from happening in person. Um, and just to re, you know, I think maybe reassure everybody, I wore kind of a Western shirt. So that while I'm healing from Virginia, right, this might feel more like I'm in Virginia City. Uh, it's also got kind of a nice Maynard Dixon palette is what I was going for here today. So anyway, um, yeah, so, you know, I started thinking about this Boulder Dam imagery in 2017 when Anne very kindly invited me to speak at the museum in conjunction with a different Dixon show. And when she invited me to work on this essay, I was thrilled to kind of really sink my teeth into this material. Um, so, you know, the talk today will be five sections, uh, about 40 to 45 minutes in length. Uh, we will have some Q&A, so I really do welcome your questions. And, you know, this essay is really about kind of thinking about Dixon's Boulder Dam imagery in its larger context. So Dixon's really gonna be the kind of the big middle third of this talk. And we'll look at sort of the other artworks that are being, or other images that illustrators, photographers, and painters are making of the same project that was really talked about as being a new wonder of the world and, and really presented a lot of challenges to artists. Like, how do you possibly envision that? Um, so, and yeah, a lot of the talk's gonna be from the catalog, but I tried to weave in um, and set into dialogue more of the works in the exhibition. Um, so you may see some of those in the galleries if you have a chance to, to go up after or if you've already done so. So, uh, all right, I think we're ready to go. John, just so you know, we can see your mouse. So if you might want to move that out of the screen, that would be great. The mouse? Your cursor? There you go. Oh, that's so funny. I thought you meant an old school. <laughs> that's actually helpful because I can, okay. All right, our name. Someone's, I would have to leave the meeting. Someone's audio is on. I believe it's, well, I'm not going to call anyone out. Maynard Dixon's paintings and drawings of the construction of Boulder Dam. Here, I tried to leave the meeting. I think Jeffrey Armstrong, I'm sorry to say, I'm, I'm hearing you. Yeah, I'm learning your secret thoughts. One more reminder, if you're joining us online, please make sure to mute your microphone. Otherwise, we'll attempt to do that for you also. It's true. John, it's why tr don't you have a, a restart? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all that. Thanks. Again, 2020 PTSD. So, okay, Maynard Dixon's paintings of Boulder Dam construction. Uh, appear rarely in the literature on the prolific artists, no doubt, because in both subject matter and in tenor, they really depart dramatically from the nostalgic frontier scenes with which he established his reputation. But these two dozen artworks mark a real critical watershed in his career and anticipate his gritty streetscapes inspired by the 1934 general and waterfront strikes in San Francisco and canvases of unemployed migrants adrift in the luminous California countryside. His unpublished reminiscences described his feelings about this dramatic economic downturn. Quote, 1930, growing feelings of oppression, something ominous and unavoidable impending, of being caught in the slowly closing jaws of a vice, of complete helplessness in the face of fate, end quote. 
While a handful of works made early in the decade do convey this portentous mood, which lurks in the menacing and sinister forms of shapes and fear and the merging of spring and winter, his interpretations of Boulder Dam can constitute his real first sustained effort to grapple with the crisis of the Great Depression. Witness to the physically punishing and psychologically alienating nature of industrial labor, not to mention significant workplace injury and death, his experiences filled him less with hope for the nation's redemption from recession than bewilderment and pessimism about the seeming futility of the project. Although Dixon privately endorsed Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal programs, his damn vignettes narrate a tragedy without clear antagonists. The politics of these tableau become clear when we contrast them with the triumphal and technotopian imagery of a handful of a harnessed nature commissioned by construction companies and the government. Okay, Boulder Dam informed the painter's work just twice over his career. Dixon, his wife, Dorothea Lang, and their children visited the construction works in October of 1933 during a meandering tour from Zion to California. The resulting portfolio of Nevada and Utah scenes hung in gumps in San Francisco from November 20 to December 11, and then at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. None of them sold. At this stage, the only evidence of his industrial pilgrimage appeared in the right foreground of Men and Mountains, where he exchanged a preliminary vignette of Native Americans and horses for a Lilliputian building site. The following year, as the Depression continued to deepen, Dixon accepted an appointment from the Public Works of Art Project, or PWAP, to capture progress on Boulder Dam, where his brother-in-law, Martin Lang, had already found employment. Bunking with the workers family in Boulder City, the company town created in 1931 to house employees, Dixon spent 36 days in the trenches of the dam site in April and May of 1934. He exhibited a suite of 10 oils, four watercolors, mm -hmm. sorry, and 10 drawings at the administration building in Boulder City, and then at the de Young Museum in San Francisco. This ambitious venture that Dix Dixon tried to document reg aimed to regulate the often tumultuous and unpredictable flow of the Colorado River, provide water for irrigation and urban consumption, generate hydroelectric power, and furnish opportunities for leisure. Enacted by Congress on December 21st, 1928, the Boulder Dam Project Act, or H.R. 5773, authorized $165 million, which was the largest federal appropriation at the time, for construction of the dam proper, the All-American Canal that would siphon Colorado River water into California's Imperial Valley and other collateral undertakings. The relocation of the endeavor from Boulder Canyon to Black Canyon, 20 miles downstream, so Boulder Dam is not in Boulder Canyon, and some 400 miles from the Gulf of Mexico did not change the name of the development, but politics did. Born Hoover Dam in the pages of HR 5773, the project became Boulder Dam after the election of FDR in 1933 and then Hoover Dam once more when Republicans recaptured Congress in 1947. So gargantuan was this task that it required not only the supervision of the Bureau of Recl Reclamation, but also the collaboration of several major construction concerns consolidated into the six companies incorporated. Upon establishing the infrastructure necessary to transport equipment, material workers, and power into a remote desert canyon, the consortium began in May 1931 to dig over three miles of diversion tunnels to liberate the chosen section of gorge from the river. After, freeing the after forcing the Colorado into its new subterranean course on November 13th, 1932, crews prepped the dam site. High scalers dangling down canyon walls freed loose, porous, or otherwise unsuitable rock with drills and dynamite, while teams carved and cleared the dry channel down to bedrock by June of 1933. Excavators quarried four more miles of spillways and a network of tunnels that would feed water to a bank of massive turbine generators uh, here in green. Meanwhile, the six companies strung nine long cables across the chasm by May 1933 to shuttle laborers across and, more critically, transfer concrete from rimside plants to its final resting place in the dam, the intake towers, and the powerhouses. Dixon visited this venture during the next project phase. On June 6th, a cylindrical bucket, seven feet tall, almost seven feet in girth, and suspended from a cable high above, decanted the first of some half million 16-ton loads of concrete, 27 cubic feet at a time, day and night, until a total of 4.5 million cubic feet 
oozed into place by May 29th, 1935. So the dam is pink from above. By then, the Bureau had already begun impounding the Colorado, Colorado and was still completing the power plants. Coverage teemed with superlatives. By nomenclature in, in Arch Gravity Dam, the Colossus was the largest hydroelectric facility and the largest concrete structure erected to date, over 700 feet tall, over 600 wide, feet wide, and 45 feet at its crest. Interior Department literature crowed that this volume of concrete could pave a road 20 feet wide from Florida, California, and the 30 million acre feet of water that Lake Mead could impound not only made it the largest artificial lake in the world, but could offer everyone on the planet with 5,000 gallons each. Dixon's interpretation of this modern day world wonder did not, however, generally linger on these triumphal and awe-inspiring achievements. Other artists he recognized were attending to those aspects of the enterprise. Quote, the paintings of the mechanical and engineering end of it, he confided to the San Francisco examiner upon his return to the Bay Area, quote, had been taken care of by other people. Indeed, government and industry had conscripted an informal squad of chroniclers since they were acutely aware of the merits of the visual, quote, we want the world to know what is going on there, asserted Bureau of Reclamation Commissioner Elwood Mead. And for that purpose, nothing is as effective as a good picture, end quote. Mead's most prolific foot soldier was Ben Glaha, an engineering draftsman at the Bureau since 1925, who had designed schematics for Boulder Dam, starting in 1931 before gradually transitioning into a full-time documentary photographer. Then preceding Dixon on the PWA he rolls was Stanley Wood, so another artist paid for by the government, whose 11 watercolors illustrated a 10-page spread in the May 1934 issue of Fortune, where the magazine identified him as, quote, the state artist on the Boulder Dam project, end quote, not, not Dixon, note, or you might note. The six companies, meanwhile, contracted George Pettit to recount the saga of Black Canyon in the bluntly titled book, So Boulder Dam Was Built, in 1935. The images and accounts that came to shape the public's perception of the endeavor repeatedly returned to martial analogies to indicate its scale, deadliness, and patriotic character. The text framing Wood's cycle in Fortune observed how the laborers or, quote, construction stiffs live and work like soldiers in times of war, end quote. Pettit's account for the manufacturers agreed that, quote, the struggle to curb the Colorado River was truly a war a war against the incorrigible and frequently barbaric for forces of nature, end quote. And he listed irrigation, jobs, and electricity among the campaign's many spoils. Likening public works to combat ennobled what many critics at the time considered a wasteful boondoggle that would only compound the depression. While numerous worksite hazards endangered crews, employees toiling high above the riverbed most handily incarnated the bravery of those whom fortune lauded as, quote, casually heroic men who build out of ancient desolation so great a monument. Published in the September 1933 issue of Fortune, Glaha's Rigor on Construction Head Tower During Construction presents Louis Paul Isoglio smiling as he perches comfortably atop the cable works like an eagle in its airy or a saint on a cathedral tower. It stands a perfect extension of the girders below as Oglio rises high enough above the railway trestle and the visible river channel that his bare torso gleams with sunlight streaming over the lip of the canyon. You know, bear these in mind because Dixon's approach is going to be very different. Cliffface employees provided especially rich fodder for this rhetoric of courageousness. Frequenting numerous organs like the cover of the May 12, 1935 issue of the New York Times Magazine, Blaha's high scalers drilling into Canyon Wall, 500 feet above the Colorado River at Black Canyon. He's not very terse with his titles. Even more dramatically, juxtaposes five poised and casually heroic laborers with the Colorado far below. The Fortune watercolors also fixated on the site's industrial acrobats. Quote, throughout these paintings, Mr. Wood has used as a constant motif the deliberate aerial dance of men in bucket, steel in timbers, dizzily strung above the chasm, end quote. His illustrations teem with riggers, high scalers, and men nonchalantly riding skips, girders, cable hoists, and other equipment across great voids. These grand vistas further betoken the control and orderliness the Bureau exerted over both workforce and gorge. 
the long prospects and pictorial tidiness of photos like handling 30 foot diameter steel penstock pipe by cable wafer placement in upper Nevada header tunnel denote the mastery of operations and the Colorado alike. No less than the lengthy descriptive title, Blaha's composition offers a legible, harmonious, and comprehensive visual accounting of a massive, gridded, and crenellated concrete obstruction that handily blocks the slender river beyond, and an elegant, coordinated ballet of three cable cars transporting men and material across the chasm, while elevators transit the face of the dam. Our high and distant vantage thereby affords the illusion of a complete picture of complex but seamless construction. These damscapes further allege that Bureau and industry waged this battle of Black Canyon with methodical efficiency. In Drillers at Work on Canyon Wall, Glaha captures a linear phalanx of seven high scalers as they attack the bluff from their bosun's chairs. The visual wedge they form as a unit implies a coordinated assault. Glaha acknowledged that his tenure as a draftsman greatly informed his camera craft, healing engineering drawings for their, quote, beauty of precision, the beauty of pure function. He confided to US Camera Magazine that, quote, I am confident that the training I received over the drafting table has influenced my photographic attitude and practice more than anything that I ever learned about photography as such. Focusing his draftsman's eye on the dam works, he translated a chaotic chasm into a disciplined chart. Throughout his thick dossier of prints, geometric man-made elements, cable, hose, hard hat, railing, scaffolding, penstock, consistently stand out and regiment the more irregular shapes of rock and water, as in drillers, handling, and rigor, and thereby signal the steady rationalization and containment of nature. Wood's album for Fortune equally schematizes the venture. In a vignette caption looking down the nose, his handling of powerhouse construction is no less diagrammatic than his other watercolors. Not only do rectilinear forms predominate, but the artist's blocking of personnel denotes uniform and ceaseless progress through a veritable visual assembly line. Beginning with the custodian Alabam, so my cursor's useful now, in the foreground with this bandolier of toilet paper in red, our eyes follow horizontal lines to a squad ascending a skip down here, and workers climbing a ladder. Our view then fans out horizontally to take in teams of puddlers settling concrete into place. The slashing diagonal of a chute disgorges lumber discarded after blocks harden, while a cable swings a load and three men off to the next job. In his travelogue for Harper's three years later, writer J.B. Priestley also marveled at this awesome and immaculate choreography, quote, when you see the men who have made it all, made it, all moving far below like ants or swinging perilously in midair as if they were little spiders. You note the majestic order and rhythm of the work. You are visited by emotions that are hard to describe, end quote. Ultimately, these official chroniclers of Boulder Dam heroize and laud the generals supervising this offensive against the Colorado more than the thousands of grunts. With the exception of rigor, Glaha and Wood do not individualize the stiffs whose faces remain mostly hidden. Even more, long vistas and scale anonymize toilers whose commentators variously described as gnats or buggish or as insignificant as a colony of ants, end quote. Whether in painting or photography, we almost always enjoy the vantage of command, not the enlisted men. Positioned higher than even the high scalers, we literally oversee construction. Watching crews from behind, we supervise their labor. Other artworks did not merely portray the reclamation venture from this perspective of administrators, but erased labor altogether. After the dam's completion in 1938, Fortune commissioned Charles Sheeler, for whom Glaha expressed deep admiration, to produce a set of six paintings on the theme of power. The first canvas to occupy a full page in the December 1940 volume yields an upstream view of Boulder Dam. Like Glaha's snapshots, conversation, sky and earth, visually confines a chaotic mass of rock with the gently curving crest of the dam face and a web of taut, sleek electrical power lines and towers. Scheeler's rarefied managerial vision depended on the exclusion of workers, which also and most famously characterized his reverential treatment of Ford's River Rouge plant uh, almost a decade prior. 
Even more, his signature sterile and machine-like precisionist style at once aestheticizes, rationalizes. Is it somehow your, your whole system sound. Oop, and sacralizes. So the precisionist style produces a very sort of aesthetic, religious, and, and sort of clean uh, vision of a grubby industrial workplace, as magazine captions attest. Rhapsodizing over the, quote, heavenly serenity of Schiller's, of Schiller's style, Fortune declared that, quote, it is not surprising either that the modern, modern artist depicting such a scientist's handiwork should put a devout intensity into painting. This is as truly a religious work of art as any altarpiece or stained glass window or vaulted choir. Forcing us to reconceptualize the dam as both high art and a scientist's handiwork artfully redirects our attention from manual to mental labor. The uncredited author also elaborates this point, quote, as the artists of the Renaissance reflected life by picturing the human body, so the modern American artist reflects life through the forms such as these, forms that are more deeply human than the muscles of a torso because they trace the firm pattern of the human mind as it seeks to use cooperatively the limitless power of nature, end quote. As one of six exquisite manifestations of human re reason then, conversation magically transmogrifies an engineer's blueprint into concrete and steel without the barest trace of labor, whether construction stiff or painter. So we'll, we'll compare this to Dixon's distinctive approach in case you're wondering why I'm not talking about him yet. Although he often worked alongside Glaha, Dixon offered viewers conflicting visions of the project. Returning to his an examiner interview, the painter aptly summarized his divergent from the dam's official portraiturists. Quote, the mechanical and engineering end of it had been taken care of other people. So I decided to take, make my main theme pygmy men against everlasting rock. This attention to the seeming impotence of the task deviates significantly from the heroic prospects already considered. Dixon, of course, was more than capable of fashioning more celebratory imagery, and a couple of pieces in the cycle do indeed dovetail with bureau publicity. Pouring cement, Boulder Dam, showcases three brawny and competent workers expertly coordinating the placement of a suspended 16 concrete bucket even despite the painter's exaggeration of its size. No wonder then that the San Francisco Examiner titled its illustration of the canvas, Industrial Grandeur. Elsewhere, on the, January, on the cover of the January 1935 issue of the Standard Oil Bulletin, here's my copy. The artist deploys an equally glossy and symmetrical composition to depict dauntless construction crews, triumphantly taming an industrial titan. Or, Consider another engineering subject painted at the height of jazz age optimism and on view in the galleries. As with Schiller's reverential altarpiece to the six companies, for old hoist, Ramsey Mine, we genuflect before a rusting beacon that stands emphatically and commandingly against an expanse of cerulean, like a church spire or a mountain pinnacle. Dixon presents the scaffolding as the rightful sovereign of the desert by mimicking its silhouette in the pile of tailings before it and coordinating its shade with the tongue-shaped boulder downslope. But other Dixons were quick to lampoon the bravado of most Boulder Dam imagery. Published just below pouring cement in the Examiner, the cartoonish drawing The Senator's Party staffs an overlook that offers the kinds of commanding vistas discussed above with caricatures of elite tourists rather than steely hard hats. Quote, in battle, men jest, japed the Oakland Tribune. Dixon had to have his fun, so he did the Senator's Party, showing the well-fed Senator and his equally well-fed women in pants, viewing the dam from the high point. Just how Washington, which seems to be a little sensitive about art, will take this remains to be seen, end quote. And my apologies to any women out there wearing pants. This is period sexism. The bulk of the artist's Boulder Dam suite, however, lacked both the satiric bite and the prevailing industrial jubilation of most Boulder Dam images. In the Oakland Tribune, he concurred with Wood, Glaha, Pettit, and others that combat best analogized the drudgery and the diggings. Quote, it's like war. Describing the courage of men battling nature, quote, they are fighting a great fight with bravery, end quote. But unlike these other commentators, he chronicled a more disorienting, feeble, and costly crusade. Lodging with one of the construction stiffs during his stay likely conditioned his distinctively unromantic view from the trenches. To begin with, Dixon testified to an exhausting and demoralizing desert workplace. Unlike pouring cement or his standard oil vignette, 
Tired Men trades romance for dejection with a flatter light and cockeyed off-center composition. With slack faces, sunken eyes, and crumpled forms, these depleted crewmen betoken the physically and psychologically punishing nature of industrial labor, as Dixon reported to the examiner, quote, the men seemed like robots to me. I didn't have enough time to get near enough, to get near to know them enough, but there they, there they worked in the blazing sun at 140 degrees, end quote. Contemporaries attest to the anti-heroism of tired men, quote, the group, observed the Oakland Tribune, tells the whole tale of the muscle weary, end quote. Dixon thus de depicts toil along the Colorado in a manner antithetical to his normal studio practice. Compare tired men with another group study from the previous year, Washoe Soiree, to grasp how the artist has forsaken a starry-eyed vision of community for an unflinch unflinching portrayal of alienation. While both scenes feature a horizontal lineup of seated and generalized figures across the central strip of the canvas, a drab and muddy palette has replaced a radiant spectrum of fluorescent, even tropical colors. The Washoe gather in an intimate circle, leaving space for us to join their picnic, while the stiffs exude disharmony rather than camaraderie. None make eye contact, either with us or one another, and bodies face outward rather than within. The flatbed cants away from us as though the truck has already begun to lumber off to Boulder City at day's end. Dixon harmonizes the women with their environment by weaving the hues of their clothing into the grasses and rocks around them and by extending the multicolored lines of their textiles into the creases of the boulder behind them. In Tired Men, by contrast, nature is an abstracted patch of burnt ochre and thistle that subtly clashes with the worker's attire. Down here. The disenchantment of Dixon's dam cycle also depends on a discernible pessimism about the seeming hopelessness of the project. Quote, I found there a dramatic theme man versus rock, end quote. He reported in an interview with Grant Wallace for the Federal Writers Project a few years later, quote, it gave me an impression of concealed force and of ultimate futility, end quote. The artist partly realizes this sensation on canvas and on paper by populating vast barren expanses with a mere handful of miniature pygmy men, first in Men in Mountains, then the following year in Boulder Dam Project, Catwalk, and Man Against Rock. But scale by itself does not necessarily connote, po connote powerlessness. In the 1934 studies, the disorienting absence of sky or any reference points help establish Dixon's sense of impotence and contrast instructively with the rhetoric of mastery that defines interpretations by Glaha, Wood, and Scheler. And in Catwalk and Man Against Rock, the dedication of the entire pictorial field to rock face not only makes it impossible for viewers to orient themselves, but also stymies our attempts to discern even the angle at which we look upon this boundless megalith. None of his renditions bother to show, and none of these images actually show the Colorado, which is the whole point of the project. In lieu of panoramas that clarify the sprawling topography of operations, Dixon mostly favors worm's eye views. Once more, the painter works against the grain of his conventional and celebrated landscape vernacular, which the exhibition's cover model, Pyramid Mountain helpfully epitomizes. Here Dixon utilizes long-standing convention to deliver an immediately, an immediately digestible desert scape. Each serrated range and barren plain is a distinct unit, clearly differentiated by hue, bold diagonals, and the cooler tints of atmospheric perspective. This ready legibility affords viewers a satisfying visual mastery. But in his 1934 PWA, PWAP commissions from the prior year, he abandons us to the perplexing granite eternity of Black Canyon and unmoors us from any kind of stable vantage point. Nor is this a function of the challenges that deep ravines can often present an artist. Virgin Creek Canyon, for one, demonstrates that Dixon was perfectly capable of shepherding the rocky labyrinth of a plunging chasm into an orderly series of tidy plains gently receding into the distance. The painter's preference for these confounding vistas, we might even think of them as anti-Dixons, effectively imparts his initial reactions. Quote, my first impression was one of bewilderment, end quote. His befuddlement at a, quote, display of engineering, for the understanding of which I had not the least preparation in past experience, end quote, contrasts with Glaha's prospect from a draftsman's table and Priestley's admiration for, quote, the majestic order and rhythm of the work. Dixon further communicates an atmosphere of ultimate futility by mostly presenting his pygmy men as idle and unsynchronized. 
signal station at gravel pits presents a lone figure sprawling in a temporary makeshift structure. Faceless and described by a series of angular forms, the flagman performs his role as proletarian robot, a strange blue cipher scrawled like graffiti on desert rocks. Held out limply from a shaded redoubt, his red standard reads more like a flag of surrender. Likewise, the dissipated protagonists of tired men appear as the defeated casualties of their war against nature. In his wider angle views, meanwhile, nature visually overwhelms meager construction elements, whereas the artificial structures predominate in Glahas photos and Woods paintings. Together, these tropes manifest the Sisyphusian labors of, quote, flesh and blood men opposed to a mutable rock in a great treadmill drama of lost endeavor, as Dixon phrased it. The painter even alluded to the unsafe and often deadly working conditions in and around Black Canyon, as he stressed to the examiner, quote, there they worked in the blazing sun at 140 degrees. High scalers working on the faces of stupendous cliffs, men riding cement buckets in the middle of space over canyons nearly a thousand miles deep. America doesn't realize what a dangerous undertaking it is. Four were killed when I was there and quite a few injured. The hospital was full all the time. The report that the artist, the report that artist and architect Theo White published in Harper's one month later ratified Dixon's appraisal, quote, every moment after the worker descends from the transports and takes his place, he is conscious of the innumerable and imminent dangers, end quote. A 1934 Labor Department investigation disclosed a casualty rate twice national trends. Heat stroke was a constant threat as was falling rock, tools and equipment, so much so that this was one of the first work sites where hard hats became the norm. Officially 96 men died on the job, although that total swells to, 100, to 112 if we reach as far back as the initial survey. The causes of the four deaths that occurred during the month of May 1934, likely the ones that Dixon mentioned, are fairly representative. Electrocution, falling rock, struck by a train, and a fall. In line with the painter's interview, danger is a more palpable presence in his damn suite than elsewhere. In high scalers, a pair of two-man teams drill into the ceaseless cliff face, but the sloping pitch and yaw of their wooden perches and a seeming absence of sufficient safety lines together intimate a precarious purchase. Glaha's handling of rock face crews, by contrast, rhymes the shapes of their bodies and hard hats with the forms of the rocks on which they toil to convey their ease and stability at cliff's edge in his high scalers. While numerous cables, ropes, and hoses betoken sturdy and reliable anchorage in both high scalers and drifters. In Men Against Rock, five, ti five tiny stiffs, the very name identifies them as the walking dead, face multiple perils as they threaten to cascade down the cliff, become consumed by the gaping maw of the rock face, or float off the page altogether. At the same time, only Cross on a Hill, Boulder City, Nevada, might allude directly to the lives lost during construction with its solitary cross and moody stormlight. Unlike more vocal critics of the six companies and the Bureau of Reclamation, which I'll discuss shortly, Dixon's damn vignettes narrate a tragedy without an obvious villain. Even though his interviews and reminiscences bore witness to laborers who were overheated, exhausted, surveilled, and swindled by company stores, nor does the artist indict the corporations who cut wages and accelerated work schedules to meet their deadlines and maximize profits. If anything, Dixon seemed to blame the land itself. Even as he testified that, even as he testified to, quote, the tragedy of men's labor and the great treadmill of lost endeavor, end quote, he concluded that, quote, in the long run, the desert will have the last laugh. However, unwittingly, Dixon's choice of words echoed the Bureau's party line regarding casualties. Commissioner Elwood Meade personally tried to refute unfavorable reporting in the New Republic over the summer of 1931, for example, by insisting that workplace deaths, quote, have not been excessive when the difficult and dangerous character of the work to be done and the desert location is taken into account, end quote. Thus, supervisors and artists alike essentially held Black Canyon responsible for these deaths. The same spirit of melancholy and futility would, would inform other artistic series, which Dixon took up shortly after his departure from Boulder City, that fixed even more squarely on the catastrophe of the Great Depression, including Forgotten Men and No Place to Go, which shared the same gloomy palette and enervated bodies with Signal Station and Tired Men. Yeah. 
we turn now to more critical views of dam construction. By contrast, artists and commentators to the political left of Dixon touted and centered on labor rather than management and directly implicated the federal government and the syndicate for failures in workplace safety. Based on 1937 on-site sketches and visible down a long corridor for nearly a city block, William Gropper's mural for the Department of Interior Headquarters, construction of a dam, shows, quote, men directing a crane as it moves the construction section out over the valley to be dropped into place at the dam, end quote, by the language of its official description. And this commission is based partly on not just Boulder Dam, but also the Grand Coulee Dam. So it's kind of a, a generic dam, not specifically Boulder. Here, the painter orchestrates the smooth and synchronized toil of burly energetic workers who dominate and occupy more of the composition than the distant dam works. High above, a single figure waving to the gang below rides a massive and airborne section of penstock like a confident, experienced horseman. Unlike the teensy and passive hitchhiker in Glaha's penstock pipe. I can barely see him. Where is he? There he is. Our visual access to many workers' faces individualizes them and reveals their stern determination. Even more, the artist privileges manual workers over their skilled counterparts. The supervisor with his blueprints and the surveyor with his theodolite in the central panel are more marginal to the task at hand, less dynamic than the other five, and squat lower in the painting than they had in an earlier sketch. Gropper produced scores of artworks for the member unions of the Congress of Industrial Organizations, or CIO, and other leftist organizations over his career. So naturally, he would center on robust workers whose coordination and relative visual prominence hint at how readily labor might be organized. Painting under government patronage, however, he cannot go so far as to directly allude to or advocate the unionization efforts in Black Canyon. In 1931 and 1935, the International Workers of the World commonly known as Wobblies, did organize strikes, but a bottomless supply of unemployed and a lack of federal support doomed these walkouts. Although they did impel the six companies to agree to a few modest demands that helped crews endure the, endure the brutal heat. So we must look to text rather than image to find the sharpest public critiques of working conditions along the Colorado River. In one of the New Republic pieces that had inspired Commissioner Meade's wrath, Director of the National Popular Government League, Judson King, blasted the steep human costs of industrialization for profit. Quote, manifestly, this is no place to apply high pressure production methods unless speed and profits are to be written in sunstroke, blood, and death, end quote. An almost exclusively white labor force all but guaranteed that workers of color would make even fewer cameos than casualties in representations of Boulder Dam. Although the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 forbade the six companies from hiring Mongolian labor, nothing formally prevented them from employing African Americans. The complete absence of black workers on the project drew fire from the NAACP, whose field secretary, William Pickens, eventually met with local politicians and representatives from the consortium and interior over the spring of 1932. Officials like me balked at provisions necessary for segregated facilities as hardly feasible. White crew's refusal to work under a Mexican-American foreman on railroad construction in the Colorado in January 1931 likely informed the federal reluctance to integrate the labor force. Nevertheless, management relented, and by September, 10 African-Americans had joined the payroll, although they toiled in remote gravel pits some 12 miles from the dam site. The number of Black crewmen peaked at 65 the following year, but then ebbed back to 11 by the time of Dixon's residency. In Negroes Employed as Drillers on the construction of Hoover Dam, Ben Glaha captured the only official image of these men as they paused from breaking rock into aggregate for manufacturing concrete. Unlike most crewmen in his photographic corpus, these six individuals unambiguously pose, face the camera, and do not actually work. The evidentiary character of the snapshot, as historian Barbara Villander has acutely, astutely observed in her monograph on this archive, suggests that the Bureau ordered it to rebut, charges, to rebut charges of racial discrimination, but it was never published. In a way, Gropper's construction of the dam aptly incarnates the New Deal's halting and largely aspirational conception of desegregation and anti-discrimination. 
To his credit, Harold Ickes, who served as Secretary of the Interior for the duration of FDR's four terms, was arguably the cabinet member most committed to racial justice. At Interior, he hired William Hasty as an assistant solicitor and Robert Weaver as an aide, both of whom spearheaded the push to integrate departmental cafeteria and bathrooms by 1933. At Boulder Dam, Ickes' mandates changed more than the name of the reclamation project. He decreed that African Americans could live in Boulder City over Meade's protest that, quote, unsatisfactory conditions are likely to develop, end quote. Scholars dispute the depth and legacy of Ickes commitment to civil rights, though. On the one hand, in September 1935, he mandated the proportional hiring of and equitable wages for African Americans in the public works administration, even in the case of skilled positions. On the other, there was little actual enforcement of these policies on the ground. Ickes' keen and active interest in the artworks that adorned his agency's new headquarters in Washington ensured that Gropper's painting would align with the New Dealer's beliefs and policies. Situated at the intersection of strong diagonals like an X on a treasure map, a white man and black man pose at the heart of a clutch of seven workers knit together by rhyming postures and overlapping forms at the center right of the composition. Accepting skin tone, they are indistinguishable in their hard hats and bare torsos. Cooperating in tandem to leverage a pry bar, this couple stands in intimate proximity as their helmets nearly touch. In addition, this lone African-American lacks the usual visual caricatures like exaggerated features and a very dark complexion. With his face among the most visible in the central scene, he bears greater individuality than most of his white crewmates. Then again, he is the only African-American to appear in this mural, which accords, however inadvertently, with the limitations of Ickes' desegregationist bona fides. The share of black employees only ever surpassed 1% for a brief interval in 1933. And if any, so if anything, Gropper's token figure overstates black participation. There's also no evidence that the six companies ever sanctioned interracial crews like the one at the heart of construction. Further black hires in practice had to content themselves with unskilled and remote grunt work, despite the fact that Ickes had insisted on equality of employment. So in the end, Interior could only ensure the integration of lunchrooms, and murals in its head office, but held decreasing sway the further one got from Washington. Like most visual chroniclers of the containment of the Colorado, Maynard Dixon never portrayed black personnel that we can say for sure. Circumstantial evidence hints that he may have had the opportunity. Although signal station at gravel pits takes up the same barren work site as Glaha's Negroes employed, the skin tone of the lone protagonist seems too light to unmistakably depict a black man, and it is exceedingly unlikely, anyhow, that one would have held such a relatively cushy job. And yet, in his own way, the painter touched upon the racial politics of the day. Notably, when it came time for Dixon to characterize his distinctive focus on the seeming absurdity of the enterprise, he invoked African peoples by describing laborers as pygmy men steep no less in the prevailing anti-Black beliefs of the day than his contemporaries, the artist resorted to period stereotypes about the primitive nature of inhabitants of the Congo Basin to dramatize a feeble struggle against the Goliath of the Colorado River. In the end, it's hardly surprising that Dixon's anti-heroic take on Boulder Dam construction only ever reached limited audiences. The soaring visions of Glaha, Wood, Sheeler, and even Gropper aptly suited the Bureau's propaganda operation and accordingly circulated widely in the press and in government reports, while Dixon's more fraught contributions languished in a handful of art shows. But in, in at least one respect, the painter would share a last laugh with the Mojave Desert and even perhaps with some of the thousands of the, the employees of the six companies. The first public forum for his dam suite was a show at the administration building in Boulder City. While it's unclear how he made this determination, Grant Wallace's interview reported that none other than tired men, quote, a truckload of laborers returning exhausted from their fight with rock, end quote, was the popular favorite at the exhibition. Like the artist, the stiffs, it would seem, preferred an unflinching and unidealized depiction of a brutal workplace to rosy and celebratory paintings like pouring cement. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, John. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, we can direct either online or from the those gathered here. Yeah, really would love to hear your thoughts. No. I think everybody is looking forward to going up again to revisiting the exhibition to see these paintings in person. So uh, the recording will be posted eventually on our YouTube channel. I don't, I'm not, I don't see any questions here with us. You do have one in the room. I'll bring this microphone to you so that we can oh, get it. Oh, great. Please. Anything. It's your time to have a cross-country question. Oh, question right here. Is there anything in his background personally that um, led him to some of his artistic perspectives? Yeah, that's fantastic. It's something I probably should have mentioned in the talk. So he's, I alluded to it in the fact that he had his first pass at Nevada scenes, like in, in 32, 33, they're not selling. I mean, he really suffers in his career, all his kind of corporate commissions, because he's doing right these things like Standard Oil Bulletin magazine, uh, murals for hotels and the like, and of course, studio paintings. Um, the market's bottomed out over the course of the Great Depression. And so he's really on hard times. And so just being able to get so, you know, he understands hardship and privation during this period. Um, and he's, you know, in the same kind of living conditions as his brother-in-law, Martin Lang. So I think lot of, like a lot of our other artists in the Great Depression, he's personally hit hard by economic circumstances and he's really forced to kind of reevaluate, right? The kinds of works that he's doing. Um, and I think the fact that he had kind of government patronage, which in some ways came with fewer strings than some of the other commissions that he would have had uh, in prior years, Kind of allowed him to uh, take this on rather directly. So I think absolutely. Uh, I think his personal economic circumstances is the filter through which he's kind of looking at these construction scenes. We have a question on the chat. Uh, Sandra says, nonplussed by the temperature of 140 degrees. Wondered the first time you mentioned it if it was an error, but no. How are workers able to function in temperatures that high? Um, a lot of them got heat stroke, some of them even died. Um, so, I mean, I think your body acclimates to some extent and you take breaks from work, but yeah, it's especially when you're working around metal or in like some of the, and there's lots of uh, equipment. I mean, it might've been exaggerated a little bit, but I, I think that's not unusual for like urban temperatures in, in desert environments in the Middle East or in the Southwest. Um, so I, I, I don't know, but it, it was one of the things that made the labor so so very, very challenging. And I think something like tired men kind of just begins to touch on um, this brutal workplace. What was the status of the Dixon-Lang marriage? And was there an evolution of Lang's uh, political perspectives? Um, yeah, no, again, fantastic question. So yeah, their, their marriage was not faring particularly well at this time. In some ways, these trips are an effort to kind of reconnect because, you know, Dixon's going off on these different uh, sketching excursions. And, you know, when they get back to San Francisco in, in 33, I think they, they, the, the, the clock is ticking and, and eventually um, Lang leaves Dixon for Paul Taylor, the sociologist with whom she's collaborating on a number of um, studies of migrants in California. Um, so, yeah, so in terms of like their relationship, right, this is sort of on the decline, it might have fueled the pessimism, right, of many of these scenes, although we can't say that for sure. And I think the trip really did inform not just Dixon, but also Lang, because there's a few paintings in the gallery upstairs, or one in particular, and maybe Anne will rescue me and remind me which one, which shows these, these you know, bindle stiffs, these, these migrants or Okies who are traveling across Nevada. And I think that's the first time he takes on that subject before he really is spending time on those in the late 30s. And then when Lang gets back, I mean, she's really starting to kind of take on those scenes like White Angel Breadline, which is a kind of iconic image of hers that in many ways encapsulates uh, social realism photography. Um, so this is also at the very beginning of her trajectory towards this kind of more politically minded, right, um, social concern image making. So yeah, I think, you know, the legacy of these trips and this series, I think really informs both these, these individuals' careers. Great, great questions. Well, um, a statistical question, how many men worked on the dam? You know, I was working on this myself about a year and a half ago, so I'm forgetting. I think it's around five or 6,000 total. Oh, I would have known this, you know, 18 months ago, but I'm a little fuzzy. Um, 
but I think, and maybe 4,000 at a time. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty large workforce. And, and I don't quote me on that. I might have that wrong. I just have a, a question. Is this the full, uh, it, does this encompass all his work at the dam? The one, you know, the pings that are upstairs or there, are there others? Oh, and of course, like the one on the right is actually not in the galleries. That's one of the few. I mean, Anne did an amazing job kind of pulling these things out of uh, private collections. They haven't often seen much of day, the day of light. Um, oh, boy. Again, off the top of my head, I think most of them are in here. Um, but I might be mistaken about that. I think I think we really got most of them except the one you're seeing here, which yeah. you know where it is, but it's not in our show. Yeah. So any, you know, any lenders to this exhibition, if you're in the audience, thank you so much for allowing this work to kind of air out a little bit and, and kind of receive the recognition and attention it deserves. Thank you. I'll note that um, the high scalers painting and the other painting similar in scale to high scalers, those are both in the collection of um, the Lilly Museum at UNR. So they are here um, in Reno and aren't on view too often. They were recently on view in a permanent collection exhibition, but it's nice to be able to fold those into this context. Yeah, these these two, I'm pretty sure it's, I know the one on the left and I'm pretty sure the one on the right. Yeah, I don't know if I had just missed them in the literature or hadn't really paid attention, but it was when I came to, to Reno in 2017 at Anne's invitation that I was like, these are these are not very Dixon-y, these are really interesting, so. Caitlin, is there another question or two in the chat? Uh, Sandra asked, any ideas on why Dixon's work is experiencing experiencing such a renaissance that's i'm not really sure that's interesting um this might be a question <laughs> i'm punting again to Anne, but i, I yeah i, I know you no know, dixon never really goes out of fashion there's a community of dixon you'd call them you know followers fans you know it takes a lot of work to put together a dixon exhibition all of the work is dispersed into private collections, museums. And so when a museum makes the effort to do that, there's a resurgence of energy and excitement and uh, talks. And um, you know, BYU just did a big exhibition of works from their collection and a book came out and there was some energy around that and a symposium. And I think, you know, I think that's just how, um, you know, museum exhibitions do have the potential to kind of reignite excitement and, um, interest in a particular artist or period yeah and i think and i think his, his work kind of um has more legs than some other you know kind of classically western artists because they have like the kind of very modernist influence right that i think makes them seem more of the present they're vaguely cinematic um they don't feel as much like illustration as maybe earlier generations of paintings did so i think i think that's maybe why he has more legs than other kind of chroniclers of the west but that's just my take could you repeat your previous uh, book titles and the forthcoming one? So the first one is about the uh, cultural patronage of the, the big four or big five of the Central Pacific Railroad. And it begins manufacturing the modern patron in Victorian California. And then it keeps going from there, which was not my choice. Uh, the publishers kind of wanted to well, anyway. So that's that. That's that. Uh, and my website, I'm at James Madison University. So you can kind of find all this information uh, on my website as a way to look. Um, then last year, um, Moybridge and Mobility is a shorter two author study that kind of tried to reconsider the stop motion photographs of Edward Moybridge, um, who you may be familiar with from any number of different contexts, including the movie Nope that came out a couple of years ago. Um, and so that my portion of that was really looking at sort of the way black athletes appear in that series. The new work I'm looking at is not out. It's with um, it's under what's called peer review now with the University of California Press. And that's mixed media, the visual culture of racial integration uh, that focuses really on the 40s. And so it, I already knew about the Gropper. I was writing about it for this book. And so the invitation by Anne allowed me to kind of combine my interest in Dixon uh, with my examination of how integration is being depicted in things like federal murals. And maybe it'll, who knows? Fingers crossed when that, when that comes out. So I've always followed John's work. I'm always circling around his research because even though he's based on the East Coast, a lot of it has to do with the West and work here that's, relevant to us, um, particularly his um, work with the railroad collectors um, and what they collected. And you know that's so much a part of our history here in this region. 
and the, all of his research on representations of the Boulder Dam. Um, these are all ideas and projects that I keep huge files on for possible future exhibitions. So hopefully we'll be seeing John again. He doesn't know it yet, but uh, at least in the next decade sometime. It would be wonderful. And I've had such a great time both in writing this material and then getting to present it right to people of Reno and beyond. So, um, and we'll see, I mean, actually it's something else I'm working on. Book four is gonna look at controversies surrounding federal murals from the 1930s to the present. And there's some really interesting stories that are coming out of places like Arizona, Oklahoma, and Texas. No, no Nevada case studies, unfortunately for that, but um, uh, yeah, it's hard, to, it's hard to keep away from the West I found. With that, I think we'll wrap this up here now and the people in the room, if you'll join us in thanking John I. Thank you again. Thank you, always a privilege. Fantastic questions. Thanks to everyone on Zoom for uh, chat, for joining us remotely. Hey John, see you soon.